try it out and continue from there. So as you can see, it's a much smaller part and it is easier to get started with that one. So what I'm going to talk about today is how are we going to deal with some of the testing challenges that you might face when you're working in an agile release train. The concept of an agile release train is basically a team of teams. It consists of 50 to 125 people. And it is the intention, just like a normal agile team, that the train itself is cross-functional and will be able to deliver the solutions in scope. So there are many things that are similar between an agile release train and a normal agile team. So they're not that different, although when you look at the big picture, they look quite different. So let's take a look at it to see how similar this actually is, to understand both that we are scaling, but we are also having many of the same concepts. We're still talking agile, we're still talking lean. Um, all these principles are still valid. So if we compare what is it we do in an agile team with what is it we do in an agile release train, if we look at the roles first, we had a brief look at it before, but we know in an agile team we have a product owner. The product owner is responsible for the backlog of the team to uh, help refine the user stories, to set the vision for where the team and the product the team is developing is going. And this is probably quite familiar to you. When we go to the agile release train, there is a similar role, but it's called product management. At this level, we are looking at what is it the Agile release train is going to do. Because the Agile release train has a backlog just like the team has, but only one backlog, not three or four backlogs from different stakeholders. There's only one backlog and all teams are pulling from that one. But the basic responsibility is the same. It's just the perspective. You're having the whole Agile release train, whereas the product owner is focusing on his or her team. Scrum Master. You're all, I assume, familiar with Scrum Master if, if you have worked in an Agile team. Facilitating the team's way of working, dealing with impediments, handling risks, and there are many other things that a Scrum Master could be involved in, and it depends a little bit on your take on the Scrum Master role. And then on the Agile release train, we have the same, but here it's called a release train engineer. It's a very fancy word or American word for a train conductor who's basically steering the train. But the responsibilities are the same or similar, but for the whole Agile release train. And then we have the development team or the Agile team together with the product owner and scrum master, who's the ones who are actually working with our systems. And they have the technical responsibility for the solutions that they develop and also the product responsibility within their scope. And when we come to the Agile release train, we have a system architect. And that role is responsible for the more longer term vision and preparation of technical infrastructure. It could both be the architecture, it can be um, the whole um, server environment, how is it we're going to set that up, and other things related to the solution that we're building. So, as you can see, Although the picture is quite big, there are many similarities between what we do today in a normal Agile team and what we would be doing if we were using Scaled Agile Framework. So what do we also have of similarities? Ways of working. You know, the team is planning. It's something we do for each iteration, each sprint, depending on the method we use. And usually we will have two to four weeks iterations duration. The Agile release train works exactly in the same way. The only difference is the cadence is having a longer duration, so to speak. So we are working with eight to 12 weeks for the Agile release train. Some people like to do it every quarter to say that's a good rhythm. And some people like to go for the shorter one, which would be eight weeks and have a rhythm for every eight weeks the train would be having activities and start a new iteration on the train level. This is called program increment or PI. 
And we'll come back to that later because that's one of the biggest differences in SAFE compared to just doing Scrum or some of the other more team level methodologies. When we come to the execution and running the normal iteration, we have our stand up meetings where we synchronize, where we make sure we are on track and we coordinate and communicate what are we doing. And exactly the same thing exists on the train. Here it's just called Scrum of Scrums and Art Sync, and it's usually on a weekly cadence. Some people do it once a week, some people do it several times a week. So I tried in one train where we had a variation of Scrum of Scrums and Art Syncs, and that basically meant that we had the train syncing every single day, either with a Scrum of Scrums or an Art Sync. But you can also just have it maybe twice a week, and then it's with some days in between. Then you also, of course, have the review in the teams where you demo what it is you've done and you look at it and how far did we come. And the same thing exists on the train. Here we call it a system demo and it involves all the stakeholders and all the teams. And the difference is the team is demoing your user stories, but on the train, the focus is the features. So we have, again, different perspectives, but it's the same thing we are trying to achieve. We're trying to gain feedback on a bigger solution, which we have integrated, delivered by several teams. And then finally, retrospective. This is something that is really important, of course, so we learn as we go, we can improve. And the team has a retrospective after or at the end of each iteration. On the train, it's called inspect and adapt. Exactly the same thing, but here it's all the people on the train. So we're talking about 50 to 125 people coming together to do a retrospective on how did this PI actually move along. I've put that the inspect and adapt is more strategic in view, meaning that you're doing it on a basis of maybe every quarter or every eight weeks and you have a longer time horizon to actually make changes. That also means you have the potential to do bigger changes because you have your leaders and your stakeholders involved. Whereas when you have your team retrospective, it's within your team usually, and you're looking for the next two weeks and you're very busy at delivering, so you can't put make a lot of big changes in two weeks time frame. Good. Yes? Correct. So, do they have the same uh, standard review and retro like uh, if they would be working alone as a one team? Yes. Is inside the general release chain. Do they have all that is on the left? Yes. So, the question is if the teams on the agile release train would have their own team events yes. and then the agile release train events. And they would. The team themselves in my view, decide how they want to do their own team ceremonies. So some might choose to have a daily stand-up, some might choose not to have it daily. And then you have on the train where you say, we are not interested very much in what you're doing on your team level, because that can very much depend on your team structure, who you are, how you're located, what you're doing. But you need to be able to come together with the other teams on these events and you figure out how you do that yourself um, in a self-organizing way. So in that sense, you can say what is important to understand with safe and scaling is if we don't need to scale, don't do it. Because it does add some overhead, it does add some coordination because we're a lot of people. But if you don't need to be a lot of people, then don't try to use a framework like this because you'll just get the worst of both worlds. You'll get no agility and you'll just get a lot of admin overhead. And that's no, you know, not valuable for anyone. So you really need to need this to do it. Otherwise you're shooting yourself in the foot or maybe directly in the hip, depending on how you see it. But it's a good question. And that's also why getting this to, to fly and to find out how do we balance between what is our normal team events 
and what is our train events. That's a balance you need to find, and maybe some of the train events can replace some of your team events so it evens out, because we don't, we're not looking to have more admin. That's not what we're after. Good. Now, again, SAFE is a framework. That means it's fairly um, high level, in the sense it shows how you can do Agile as an enterprise. And we're talking enterprises who might have 20,000 people as contributors to systems or even more. So really big scale. They're not very interested in the teams themselves because we already know that. We've, done, we've been doing this hopefully for some years, maybe decades. So basic agile teams is fundamental. We just take it for granted that this is what we need to do. Now this said, SAFE is also used in organizations where you might not have used agile methodologies before or where you're not thinking in an agile manner. So they also have a way to, you can say, quick start a company to take a big leap from whatever they do now into an agile mindset. So you can do both. But when we talk about testing, I'm not going to go into these things. I'm just going to mention that this is seen as something we take for granted before we start scaling. So if we're already struggling with this, then it's really important to get some of these basic things in place before scaling up, or at least we can anticipate even more challenges if we don't have these things. So, for test first approach, we also have automated delivery and deployment. Scaled Agile Framework is going extremely um, into DevOps, and how is it we're going to integrate that into a framework? And then, of course, testing in the same iteration. And I know these things goes without saying if you have been successfully uh, agile and, and maybe restructured and found a way to work where you can actually manage to do this. But in many places in Denmark, it's not quite the case yet that the, all the teams are working like this and all the companies are well set up with the automated deployment pipelines, et cetera, et cetera. So bear in mind that these things are not forgotten in the framework, but they are more or less taken for granted. So SAFE is not talking much about how you do this. It's a framework. If you don't know how to do it, they say, well, go out. There's so many good resources to help you do these things. So let's assume we have this in place and move on. So what happens when we go in and scale? Well, it's the same thing. It's just bigger problems. But we find the challenges in the same places as we do with normal Agile teams. So there's actually not much new here to say, yes, how do we do test planning in a very short iteration? Now we have a program increment where we have a little bit longer horizon, but we're still doing team iterations. So we need to be able to do both. If we cannot do it on team level, it also becomes harder to do it on program level. So I'm going to show you some things that I've tried out in a previous uh, organization. And these are just ideas that you can see if you can use. And it's just to have something to say that, yes, SAFE comes as a framework with many good things, but sometimes we need to adapt, adapt a bit to what the framework does and says. Good. So, for those of you who are not familiar with SAFE, let me just ask, how many have participated in a PI planning event? Okay, that's significantly fewer than actually know about SAFE. That's good. So, basically, a PI planning event is where the whole train, meaning 50 to 125 people, come together and do planning for two days. So, physically, you come together, in a big room like this, this could probably be pretty good for yeah, PI planning, suitable, yes. And you meet up. Now, some of you might think, well, I'm with a lot of teams and some of them are sitting in India or in, in Poland or Denmark or US, so how can we get face to face? That's going to be a bit expensive. And yes, it is. But the theory here is also you do it in multiple locations. So 
if you only have a couple of people in the US, fly them in. But of course, if you have one or two teams sitting in the US, then you need to have a planning location in the US as well. So what we did, we were having one in the Nordics, and we would have one in India. So it is one of the most important things that they uh, scaled Agile C in the framework, the thing that actually separates it out from many other things. So they basically say, if you're not doing PI planning, you're not doing safe. So that's why this is one of the biggest elements to actually help scale up Agile in, the, in their minds and framework. So, at the PI planning, you have all these team presence and stakeholders and the new roles we saw, product management and system architect, release train engineers, and you're getting together to build a plan for the next PI, which could be a quarter or eight to 12 weeks. Now, it is documented in what is called a program board. And a program board could look like this, where you basically have some swim lanes for your teams. So let's say there's six teams on your train. There could be more, there could be less. You could have some milestones, events that you are uh, targeting. And then you can have some deliveries from other people in, uh, in your organization who's not on the train. So it's a quite lightweight plan you're ending out with at the end of the two days. So what did we do where I was um, working? We basically said in order to get some focus on testing, we really need to have a separate lane, swim lane, for the release testing that we need to do. At that point in time, the teams were not fully cross-functional, so we were having a team who were actually taking care of, you can say, the final release testing before we were going out into production. So we added a lane, but it was not meant for that team. So that team would have it, its own swim lane and the release testing would be something we would do before we would actually be able to get to our business milestones. And then how did we use it? So if we look at a simple scenario here, you can see we have a feature that's a blue thingy so you basically put in the sprint or iteration where you're going to complete the feature by that team in that column here. So you have the blue one from team one in the first sprint. Then we plan to have release testing in the same sprint, make the deployments to pre-production, to production, whatever we needed to, and then the business would roll it out in the third sprint. So that's what our program board could look like, and that's how we used it. Here's another example. What does that show you? Mm -hmm. Their dependencies, and they work on the same feature, yes. Were there other comments? Yeah, so it takes three sprints before, or in sprint three, you get the business release. So you have first sprint, you get the dependencies done as an input, and the second team finishes off it, the feature here, release testing in the same sprint, and then off we go. What do you see here? Please repeat again. Yes, exactly. So we have multiple features going out and being deployed separately, maybe in our production environment, but not enabled, or it's available, but not um, pushed out to our customers, for example, and then those together will be able to give value to the business in different kinds of ways. So, as you can see, this can become fairly complex, but it can also be very simple. 
So just because we put up this release testing lane didn't mean that we always had to use it. So sometimes there could be things that were so simple and was not necessary to have in release testing and therefore could go directly to deployment and release. And again, this is what a program board could look like. And this is actually a simplified version. So you can imagine when you have 150 people planning for two days, often it becomes a spaghetti board. And it's really hard to look at it in the beginning. But what you actually find out is that it helps you see your dependencies and if things are actually going to happen in timeliness so you can release and also so that your um, dependencies are handled appropriately. So the benefits was, of course, now it's visible because everyone was looking at the program board, at the PI planning. We also had that we could check if a feature was feasible. So you look at the red line and if you see that a feature needs to be delivered and the red dependency is to the right hand side, then there is a timing issue because the dependency will come after you need to finish your feature. That's not possible. That means replanning. And that was really good because now it became a discussion about how can we get the business milestones met? Not about why is testing delaying what we're doing. It became how can we actually reorganize what we need to do as teams, everyone, to find out how do we do the business milestones. And it also became, of course, involving the business, involving the leaders to say, sorry, this is not feasible. This will not happen. What can we do instead? How can we reprioritize? What would be the most important thing you want? Because it's obviously this is not going to happen. Now, this statement, this is not going to happen, is sometimes a little bit difficult for managers to accept. So in this case, it was a separate team, but I would see it as an activity because all the teams needed to participate and help and support it. So we actually had the release testing team as a team on its own, on its own right, and then we had when is it the release testing would happen because there were more things involved than just testing. So in general, I would recommend not having a release testing team. So you can say that the Agile release train and the teams are virtual teams. So when I say we don't have a specific team for it, it is also to say that what I would recommend is that you have people from the different teams coming together to do that. But they are not seen as a fixed team together because it could depend on the content of the release. You might need different people who would be better or worse to do it. But bringing people together, and I'll come back to that, is definitely uh, a good thing. Definitely. If you hold your breath, I'll come back to it.
So if priorities changes during a PI, which is a quarter, which happens always, it always happens. It always happens within a sprint for the PO. It always happens within a PI for product management. The good thing is that you have this one. You have this and you can go back and say, okay, if this feature is not so important any longer, or maybe it's really important and we need it earlier, which of the other ones is it we need to postpone? What does that mean for our other milestones? Because it's again, it's a choice. Again, it's not possible to do everything in the first sprint because then we had put it up on the wall when we did our planning. Then we'd put it in the first sprint. So there is a reason why the plan looks like this. And No, so I would not do a new PI planning, but you have the synchronization. So just like the team has daily stand-up, the train has scrum of scrums and art sync. And those we used to also talk about changes in scope. What does that mean? Please go back into your teams and find out what's the impact. Can you manage? And let's come back. And that's why we actually had them so often. So within basically two days, we could have synchronized the whole train for changes, because changes come. And that's about being agile. How do I know there are different uh, add-ins coming to JIRA where you can do these things. I must admit, in the beginning, we were having a spreadsheet from hell to try and do this, or we're doing a, a normal physical board. But it, um, in JIRA, you also have glyphy diagrams, and they're different means. How much time do we have before we need to wrap up? Okay. Then let's talk afterwards. Then we'll come back to your question then. Sure. No. The more, of the of, more often you can deploy and actually deliver value, the better. But the problem is often where I come from, I've been working with financial institutions and they have a lot of legacy systems and they're not even able to deploy once every two weeks. So just trying to do that is woohoo, hooray. Um, but of course, if you can deploy seven times a day, that's better because it's smaller, more flow, more value. All right, this is actually what I was going to talk about how we can coordinate some of the things, because we use communities of practice to have test preparation and execution. Again, testing related dependencies, but also, again, so the teams say, I need help because my testing is sort of being delayed. Well, maybe we have spare capacity. Then we can start helping each other. And then we also used it to make sure what practices do we align? Yes, we are agile teams. We work in different ways. But are there some synergies we can have by aligning, or can we learn from each other? Then why not do that? Yes, so basically, using a community of practice to align across the team, or even more in your company, is an advantage. And then back to the integration testing and the system integration testing. What we tried to do, because we did not have seven releases a day, so we could wait and, and plan a bit longer. So for each PI, we would have basically the integration and system integration testing as a bug hunt. So what we would do is we would call all the teams together and say, OK, we organize a bug hunt. And it's all the roles. It's not testers. It's the developers, it's testers, it's POs, it's architects, it's business stakeholders. Anyone on the train ought to come, because now we together make sure our product is hanging together, and everyone has a stake in this. It's not a testing job we're talking about. And we also tried then to team up across different teams so we could have the knowledge sharing. So that was our way of trying to say, yes, we know we have these bigger tests we need to run, and we're not going to do it every single time within every single team. Let's coordinate on the train and use that to actually find out how do we come together on a regular cadence so it just became a regular thing to do, just like we would do any other thing. We would actually fly people together to sit together to do the bug hunt. 
And we were working on a mobile platform, so we were also sharing devices, physical devices, and try to use them for testing. And again, this about having PO's sitting with developers or business stakeholders sitting with uh, analysts or something else, that gave a tremendous knowledge sharing. And again, we could see across the features, is this hanging together? And it was usually obvious it was not hanging together. <laughs> and then we were busy trying to fix it before the actual release date. So this is one thing you can try and see. But this is not a team. This is not a release testing team. This was something we organized as part of the train with people contributing from each team. Now you use the M word, which is not a good word in Agile Manager. <laughs> but what we did was we had a community of practice, and there we had someone to lead that community of practice. Uh, I was in that role, and I took responsibility to make sure that we got these things organized. But it was the responsibility of the teams to plan it, to come with the charters, to execute them. I was only there to facilitate. Yes. Good. So very briefly, yes, I think safe is really important for, at least in Denmark, it's important to get to know. I hope you saw that there are different things to learn from it, even if you're not in a big company. There might be some practices that you can use still. And then, very quickly, I went through a little bit about the program board, about how we can use communities of practice, and this about having a bug hunt to try and tackle some of these system integration testing or broader system tests as part of our normal cadence. And if you like to read more about it, it's my, as I said, favorite topic. Uh, there is a small ebook you can download on Eurostar's Huddle page, um, where Dirk Jan and I, we talk with a lot of other people and come up with some ideas about what is it with testing and quality and safe, because it's not that well or elaborated described yet. So we think there's room for improvement, and here are some additional ideas you can read if you like. Thank you very much for listening, and sorry for going over time. I get so excited about the topic. If you have any questions, you can ask them in the corridor. Unfortunately, we just lost time. You asked questions at the end of the report, and this has exhausted the time of the report. I will give you the speaker on the mic, and she will send it to someone in the corridor, who will ask questions.